Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the 2013 CBI Annual Conference, my first as president, and it's great to see so many of you here. As an event such as this, it wouldn't be possible without the valued and continued support of our strategic partners, EY and Hayes. Thank you both very much. I would also like to thank our corporate partners, BA Systems, Barclays, CGI, and Jones Lang LaSalle. Finally, an obvious but necessary piece of housekeeping. Before we get underway, please could I remind everyone to ensure that their mobile phones are switched off. Um, also, I would refer you to the conference guide for the procedure to follow in case of fire. No test is planned for today, so an alarm will be genuine. So many thanks for that. Um, the past year has seen the UK economy move into an emerging recovery after what has been one of the most devastating global crises in peacetime history. We've started to pick up pace, optimism and confidence are growing, but the recovery is still fragile. It is critical that we now ensure the sustainability of this recovery. Ultimately, only the private sector can deliver the jobs, growth and the rising living standards we need. Aspiring to one nation, Striving for a stronger economy and a fairer society, help for hardworking people. This is how each of the three main political parties describe their ambitions for this country. Business has the same ambitions. We want the economy to grow and keep growing. We want there to be investment, job creation and prosperity. We want the standard of living to rise, for youth unemployment to reduce dramatically. And we want strong economies in the regions and evolved nations with healthy back streets and resilient high streets. These are in all of our interests. Britain can only thrive with strong, productive businesses, large, medium and small, in manufacturing, services and finance, from Stirling to Southampton and Newport to Newry. One United Kingdom as part of a strong EU. Some of the rhetoric we've heard recently suggests that business is somehow the enemy. We are not. This could not be further from the truth. My message today is that we want to be, we can be, and we are partners in building prosperity. But in our competitive and interconnected world, it's not easy. We cannot afford to make it harder for ourselves. Over the last three and a half years, the private sector has created nearly one and a half million jobs. But business is undoubtedly suffering a crisis in public confidence as we have seen in banking, and now in the current debate around energy. We do have to do more to understand consumer sentiment and the effect that this has politicians, and hence on policy. The role we play in driving the recovery is crucial. As confidence returns to the boardroom, we'll need to see more investment in the months ahead, and our focus must be on making growth work for all. Encouraging a labor market which is flexible, inclusive, and provides opportunity for everyone is our goal. But to deliver at home and focus our ambitions abroad, business has to work with government to get the fundamental conditions for growth right. The coalition deserves credit for sticking to its plan on deficit reduction and the priority, priority it is now giving to infrastructure. On tax, lower rates lead to higher revenues and more jobs. So by cutting corporation tax by nearly one third, the government has sent a powerful message at home and abroad to encourage investment. We must not depart from this. Other vital ingredients are a highly skilled workforce, world-class infrastructure, certainty on energy policy, and a reinvigorated relationship with a reformed EU. On education and skills, we know investing people is the most effective way of distributing the benefits of growth more fairly. And across the country, businesses are doing ever more with schools to help young people find their way in the world. Government can help too, by holding schools to account on the things that really matter, not just teaching to the test or lead table. Too many young people fall behind early and never catch up. A recent OECD report suggested that the UK was in the bottom three developed countries when it came to literacy and numeracy skills among 16 to 25 year olds. Our system is simply not providing the younger generation with the preparation they need to fill the jobs available and keep Britain competitive. Looking ahead to a future economy that will demand ever higher levels of skill, 
it becomes alarming. In the short term, where the right skills are not available at home, we need an immigration and visa system which says we're open for business. Some of the factually incorrect, emotive debates around immigration are unhelpful and damaging. On infrastructure, vision, vision and implementation are the answer to many of the UK's perennial challenges on transport, road rail, air and energy. A coordinated plan for making this happen is essential. A lot has been achieved in the last year and firms are ready to invest. We're encouraged by government announcements, but on the ground, in some areas, the all-important delivery of new projects is just not yet happening. Political indecision is commercially harmful. Delivery has got to be ramped up. And quick wins like cross-party manifesto commitments to accept the Davis Commission recommendation on aviation would lay the groundwork for future strategic decisions. We cannot have every major infrastructure decision continuously re-debated at every turn, as we're seeing with HS2. Undoubtedly, a better effort should be made to communicate the benefits of high-speed rail, and this must be positioned with an overall long-term strategy of what the country needs across all modes of transport. Decisions have to be made, and once they have been made, we should stick to them. Politicians have a duty to help create an environment which attracts investment and encourages and rewards success. Business will then get on and do it. So it is with energy. Oversimplistic statements regarding price control or windfall taxes may play to public opinion, but they will not address the complex problems that need to be resolved. Indeed, they are very likely to have the opposite effect. The UK market is going through its biggest transformation since privatization, and is doing so in order to keep the lights on and achieve our green objectives by 2050. There's no doubt that this transformation will be costly, but there are advantages. Progress at Hinkley Point is the latest welcome example of where of investment facilitates security of energy supply and brings new jobs to the UK. The obvious issue here is how to balance this long-term investment with the short-term pressures on household budgets. People, of course, are concerned about rising prices. They feel, rightly or wrongly, that they are being unfairly treated. There are, as I said, no easy answers here, but the public deserves better than politicians playing the blame game. The public wants energy companies to explain why prices are going up, with greater transparency about operations and profits, more help on making bills easier to understand, switches easier to make, and energy use easier to manage. It is vital that more clarity permeates the areas where business touches society, especially as we're now moving to a period of substantial political uncertainty around European elections, Scottish independence, a general election, and a potential EU referendum. As the voice of business, the CBI has a critical role in ensuring that without fear or favor, the facts are on the table for the British people to make their decisions and for businesses to maintain confidence in investing. This is especially so when it comes to Britain's position on the global stage and its place in Europe. And the report we're launching today is about providing clarity around Britain's place in the global economy. The world around us continues to change rapidly. Britain must keep up. For UK businesses, that is best achieved by remaining in the EU, but arguing strongly for reform. The pace and scale of globalization has opened up our economy to new opportunities and has propelled us further and further from our own borders. Trade now amounts to 65% of our GDP. Last year, exports contributed nearly 500 billion. However, as world trade has increased, our relative share has steadily decreased. For some, this is alarming, but at the CBI, we see opportunity. We are the sixth largest global economy. We're the third largest recipient of FDI inflows in the world, over 40% of which come from EU states. And we're one of the foremost global exporters of financial and legal services. Britain is a major global player. The nature of trade is changing, and the world's economic center of gravity has unquestionably shifted eastwards. We need to grasp the opportunity that this affords. Our exports to new markets are growing rapidly, but from a very low base. So we'll continue to rely on relationships with other developed economies for many decades to come. 
It is not there, and uh, therefore an either or choice between Europe and the rest of the world. We need to trade more with both. The EU remains the catalyst for these interactions, helping to secure new trade agreements so critical in supporting international trade activity. Far from holding us back in the world, being in the EU is emphatically in the UK's interests. A recent CBI survey showed that 78% of businesses, including 77% of SMEs, want to stay in a reformed EU. There are, of course, costs to our membership, particularly in terms of the burden of some regulation which needs to be tackled. Yet businesses tell us that the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. After all, a common market needs some common principles. It is just unrealistic to think there are alternative options available to us. There aren't. Being one step removed like Norway or two steps removed like Switzerland would leave us marginalized, no MEPs, no votes, no influence over the rules we'd still need to follow in return for market access. And just being in a customs union with the EU like Turkey would not give us the levels of access for our service exports which we need for our complex open economy. The EU is far from perfect, and we need to use our influence to set in motion a reform agenda. First, we need an EU which is open, completing the single market, competitive, reducing unnecessary regulations, and outward looking, focusing on breaking down barriers around the globe that stand in the way of all European businesses. We have to focus on delivering the principle of the Lisbon agenda, which in 2000 laid out a roadmap for competitiveness which is still incomplete, rather than unpicking the details of the Lisbon Treaty. Second, we need to get the EU to do better, to better respect the limits of its authority given to it by member states, and to ensure that only, it only legislates for those things at the European level which are essential. Britain's role in the world has always been to embrace openness, to seize opportunity, harness global trends, and maximize our integration with the world's economies. Now is the time to ensure we take advantage of the realities and opportunities of the 21st century. Closing ourselves off from the world cannot be the answer. The stakes have never been higher. Britain is not owed a living. We need to earn it, and business is there to do that and for the long haul. The beginnings of our economic recovery have been hard earned and painful. We must work together across the business community, with government, with politicians, and with the trade unions to achieve a sustainable recovery based on investment, growth and employment, and an improved standard of living for all. This also means businesses continuing to recognize the responsibility they have to the communities in which they work, and particularly for the weakest in society who have been most affected by this recession. This must be our common endeavor. Thank you very much.